The Drum Candy Podcast is brought to you by Drum Factory Direct. What's up, everyone? Welcome into episode 45 of the Drum Candy Podcast. This is your host, Mike Dawson, coming to you from Drum Factor Direct in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This week, we are sitting down with the world-class bassist, Paul Thompson. Paul lives here in Pittsburgh. He started his career, uh, most notably playing with Maynard Ferguson's band, with Dave Throckmorton and the rhythm section. He also toured with the legendary saxophone Stanley Turrentine, and he is an educator. He teaches multiple schools and at West Virginia University. He's got an incredible YouTube channel. So if you search for Paul Thompson bass on YouTube, you'll get some great content. It's geared towards basses, but there's a lot to glean that helps us out as drummers. Speaking of which, this entire conversation was focused to get the bassist perspective on what he thinks the greatest rhythm sections of all time are. Just some basic bass history, which could only help us as drummers. And then some thoughts on, you know, the way the, that he prefers to play with drummers. So this is a good one. If you have any questions you've ever wanted to ask a bassist about what a drummer should or shouldn't do, I try to get to it here. So let's get to it. Paul Thompson. Let's talk about your YouTube channel first. Did this come about because of the pandemic that you got really kind of focused on it? It really seems to have blown up in the past year or so. Uh, the pandemic kind of brought it to light. Um, to be honest with you, I bought my camera uh, the September before in, in 19 with the intention of starting my channel. Oh, okay. uh, but I just didn't get around to it. In fact, in January, 2020, I was kind of doing screen tests, but I was still like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then when the pandemic hit, it was almost like the universe was like, get to work. There was nothing else to do. So I started just working on it. So how did you develop your curriculum? Um, mostly it comes out of lessons, uh, early on when we were still kind of at home, I had a bunch of things that I developed for students to help them work on constructing walking bass lines and, and feeling subdivisions and choosing notes and improvisation and things like that. So I had a bunch of lessons kind of already to ready to go. And I started uploading that material, like doing videos and I called them jazz lessons. And then it just kind of morphed into me just continuing what will happen is my best ideas I'll get during lessons. I'll have the students will be talking about a certain baseline or a feel or an approach. And I'll suddenly kind of be like, I should do a video about this. Mm -hmm. And so that's exactly where most of my stuff is coming from. It's from teaching. Is, have you found it's making you practice a little bit more intently because you know, you're going to have some content to create. Oh, definitely. Definitely. And definitely playing in my videos has made me go to another place as far as trying to get that stuff to be correct and sound mm -hmm. right and played right. Um, cause when you record it, it's gotta be good. Have you always recorded yourself or was this kind of a new exercise? I have over the years, but not as consistently as I seem to do now. And also with, with lockdown, people were started to do projects at home. So I got a lot of work as far as people sending me things and that they wanted bass lines on, whether it was acoustic bass or electric bass. So I'm doing it more than I ever have. I've done it over the years, but right now it's, it's, it's really, um, my, my muscle for recording is a little stronger than it ever has been. Mm, what's your mic of choice for upright bass? I've never had to mic up an upright before. Oh my gosh. Well, just something, uh, kind of cardioid. I use, a, uh, I couldn't tell you the actual model. It kind of looks like a, like a Neumann esque kind of, I can show it to you. Oh yeah. <laughs> looks Plenty like a Neumann -esque. something. Yeah. Yes. But, uh, I try to, it's, it's more to do with getting a clean signal and positioning it it correctly in front of the bass. I think that's where people get it wrong is where to have it in front of the instrument. Um, I also use the digital, just a regular zoom type digital recorder to capture most of my upright bass stuff for my videos. It's about where you put it and getting the best sound out of the location I've found. No kidding. So where do you, where do you put the mic? You put it by the hole? Um, no, the holes, the hole's going to get really boomy. Um, I try to put it either in front of the bridge um, cheating toward one of the F holes, usually the one on the treble side, uh, or in between right, right where the sound post would be 
backed off probably about 10 inches from where the sound post is. So you're getting partly bridge, partly F hole, but I try not to get too close because then the bottom end just overwhelms everything. You want kind of the sound that people get when they're standing in front of you and not with their ear right up against the instrument. Mm. Do you run the uh, pickup DI as well, or is it all mic'd? No, it's all mics unless I really need some something funky as far as the sound goes or, or that kind of sound. Uh, I'm going for straight acoustic sound and, and that kind of sound production. I want everybody to hear what I'm hearing. When you do electric, is it amp or DI? Oh, I totally go DI and I use everything that Logic, I use all the amp modeling stuff that Logic has. I will like compress the heck out of it. And I'll get different results. Some of my videos, the early ones, you can hear that the bass is pretty much flat. Um, and then later ones, I've really messed with the amp modeling and stuff. And you can hear them kind of squash, but I'm kind of going for something on some of them. So it depends. It depends on the video. But I'm, I'm content to just go into Logic and see what kind of sound I can create from a DI signal. Nice. Glad to hear you're a Logic user. I've been yes. I've been on that train for a while. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can, it's it's really user friendly. I found, and I did GarageBand before that, so it was an easy bridge into. And, you know, the learning curve was was fairly easy, and you can you can make it as complex or as simple as you want. Mm. And that's what I like about it. I don't have to learn how to do thirty things before I can do two things. You know, I can I can start adding things on and learn as I go. Dig it. Well, let's talk a little bit about some bass history one hundred and one because I don't. I don't know that we've talked about enough. You think sure. about, um, at least not from a drummer's perspective, but who who's largely credited for being like the first bass player? Wow. Well, to be honest with you, a lot of the early bass players, um, if we're talking jazz music, um, are coming out of the marching band tradition. And it was a very mobile kind of music. So a lot of the earliest guys were doublers. They played tuba. Um, they played baritone saxophone. They, they played big, low instruments that you could march with in marching bands. And then the bass became more of a chamber instrument. When the, when the music moved indoors, then the bass became kind of the, mu the instrument of choice for the low end. And a lot of these guys who played these tubas and things started doubling on the acoustic bass. Um, so a lot of your early bass players, um, from New Orleans where the music really was born doubled on both instruments. But the first guy to really walk a bass line, the first guy to play four, four time on the bass, the guy who a lot of people say invented walking bass was a guy who played with Duke Ellington named Wellman bro. He was probably, we don't know for sure, but he was all, everything points to him most likely being the first guy to play four, four time on the bass and walk so he's kind of the father of the walking bass line. Oh, wild. Is that, so what records should we be looking for? Early Ellington oh stuff? Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, early Ellington stuff. I wish I could tell you. I'm not quite the historian as some of my colleagues are. I heard a great podcast you did with Thomas Went. Oh yeah. <laughs> and he would, he would totally take me to task right now for not knowing the Wellman Bro records <laughs> that I could refer you to. Because my listening starts more around the late 30s is where I really started digging into it. But um, he is on, he did play with Duke Ellington on a lot of stuff. So it's not that hard to find. So who would be the next person that you would credit as like taking the bass somewhere new? Or oh my goodness. Well, I mean, it, it all kind of starts, there have been great bass players, but kind of the Galileo of bass was uh, Jimmy Blanton who uh, Ellington discovered in the late 30s. Um, this was a time when bass players were just kind of playing 4-4 four, four time. If they got a solo, it was just a glorified break where everybody would stop and the bass would play by itself for two or four bars. Um, Ellington was playing in East St. Louis, and uh, he went to bed after the concert, and his band went to an after-hours joint to have a jam session, and they heard this bass player who was playing solos like a horn player. He was playing arco and pizzicato in a way no bass player ever had before. So they went to the hotel and woke Duke Ellington up and brought him to this after hours place. And he heard Jimmy Blanton 
who at the time was about 20, 21, I want to say. And uh, he hired him on the spot. And he traveled with two bass players for a while. So Blanton, like I said, he he was playing melodies. He was playing horn-like lyrical solos. But he also brought something to the walking line that bass players had never seen before. He brought a continuity and a shape to walking lines, directional walking lines uh, that were very sophisticated and moved in one direction for several bars and had chromatic movement and no choice Um he, he was very, very sophisticated, and he died only a couple years after of tuberculosis. Mm. So he had a very brief and very important spotlight, but he was on Duke Ellington's band with Ben Webster and some of the other great musicians. As far as that goes, there's a CD you can get called the double CD called the Blanton Webster Years um, that feature this band that, that had all these great musicians. Um, Jimmy Blanton also was the guy who's on the original take the A train record that's walking. Um, so he was just, he was better than anything that had come before him. If Jimmy Blanton got in a time machine right now and came to 2022, he would be one of the best bass players on the planet. He was that good. Uh, he also played a bunch of duets with Duke Ellington that they documented, the special relationship that's great uh the the gym, uh, there's a duke ellington record called duets solos and trios that, that has all the blanton duets on it that's really outstanding but he as far as a lot of people goes he's kind of the north star because out of him comes the, the tree of everyone else mm. oscar pettiford was a direct branch off that tree ray brown was a direct branch off that tree paul chambers was a direct branch off of the Blanton tree. He influenced so, so many people. And there are so many icons on bass that came right out of him. So he's, he's, he's probably one of the most important, if not the most important bass player in the history of jazz. Wild. So you've mentioned two Ellington bass players. Yes. And I think from the drumming perspective, we often credit Count Basie's band as being the one that innovated <sighs> the most. So who would be the bass player that would have locked up with Joe Jones or whoever else was in the band? Oh my God. That would be Walter page, Walter page and the huge, huge sound and time. And the whole idea of the great rhythm section, in my opinion, was moved forward with Walter, Walter page and Joe Jones and, and count Basie's band. In fact, count Basie's band used to be Walter page, and the Blue Devils, I believe they were called. It was Walter Page's band. He was the band leader before Count Basie became the face of the band. But Walter Page was definitely one of the great um, walkers of the bass, one of the great rhythm section players on the instrument. And I think it's important as bassists and drummers, we need to know, uh, if you know who your favorite bass player was, you should know who the drummer was that they played on most of the time with on, on all those records. It's important to know um, if, if you like Walter Page, he played with Joe Jones. If you like Paul Chambers, he made a ton of records with Philly Joe Jones. If you like Ray Brown, well, Ed, Ed Figpin was the drummer in the Oscar Peterson trio. So you have to somewhat become a historian to really get into this stuff. But when you do, it's like so amazing. But yeah, so to answer your question, Walter Page. Walter Page was the, the yeah the original Count Basie bass player that that really defined how hard you could swing and what playing a quarter note meant to a band. Wow, so many directions. So you kind of mentioned some of the other names I wanted to to focus on. Um, I'll come back to one of them. But let's talk about Paul Paul Chambers. He played with so many legendary drummers. Um, I'm wondering what in your opinion, is the best combination of him and a drummer? Wow, that's a great question. It's hard to argue what he did with, with, uh, with anybody beyond Philly Joe Jones as being, it's hard to say that anything matches that as far as output and the way that they played together. It was so special, in my opinion. Um, they're on so many iconic recordings together, but the way they complemented each other, um, the way they locked with each other. And, you know, I'm not saying that Paul Chambers didn't really have an amazing lock with other guys. I love the way he played with Art Taylor. Um, I love the way he played with, obviously, Jimmy Cobb. 
um, so many great guys, but the way he played with Philly Joe, they had a really special combination, um, especially the Miles Davis stuff. Um, what a great place to start if you're trying to tell somebody about playing great rhythm section playing. Go get any one of these amazing Miles Davis records, you know, milestones, uh, you know, w- with Philly Joe and Paul. It's one of the iconic rhythm sections in my opinion the, the way they played time the way they complemented the soloists the way they played for each other the way philly joe played behind paul i mean it's it's like the definitive definitive jazz playing of a bass and, and a drummer uh together do you hear anything i mean what do you what does he do differently with the other guys like is it is it a timing thing is it a tonal thing? i mean it's hard for me to define, but there's definitely a difference when he plays with Philly Joe versus Art Taylor, but I wouldn't know what it is. Like, is it something you can quantify? Uh, in some ways you can. Uh, I think in some instances you can say, oh, well, he's playing a little bit ahead here and he's laying back and playing a little bit of behind as far as the beat. But what, the way I see it is that every drummer, and this is from my experience too, nobody... Um, how can I put this? Every drummer phrases differently. Mm-hmm. Every drummer is phrasing differently when he plays with them. Some drummers um, kind of listen and float over things and wait for you to find your space. Some drummers give you the space. They, they say, here it is. Here's one, two, three, four. Let's play together. And sometimes bassists and drummers find the space together. And that's what I'm hearing with 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 philly joe and pc i'm hearing them find the space together and fit like a glove it's hard for me to to put it in into technical terms beyond that they play so well together uh and it feels so good the bounce the hump the two and the four of what they're doing is just amazing and i've heard them both play with other musicians but there's just something magical um about the way they locked up. We, we hear about this, this phrase, the hookup, man, it was like the two of them were thinking the same thing at the same time. There's, there's something effortless about it. Um, whereas with other drummers, there might be a, a forward energy like uh, giant steps is one of my favorite records. And there's a forward energy that happens with, with PC and R Taylor that that's not quite the same thing as when he plays with Philly Joe, but that's what I'm, I'm when, when I'm playing bass with a drummer, I'm looking for, um, I'm looking for that time, but I'm trying to see where their energy is going to be. Is their energy going to be with mine? Exactly. Is it going to be dancing on things? Is it going to be a thing where I'm going to follow them? It comes in so many different ways. And just when you find that perfect hookup, that's, it's just like you're finishing each other's sentences, and that's what it sounded like to me. The two of them do. Mm. Do you have a preference? Would you rather be the one who kind of controls where the quarter note is, or do you, I mean, how? Do, what type of approach do you prefer? No, I I would rather we do something together. But I'm I can totally follow if I have to follow. But once again, everybody has a different thing. I got to play. I was really fortunate. Uh, last month I played a gig with Kenny Washington. He came into town and, uh, his, his time was very like listening and trying to figure it out. He wasn't forceful at all, but he was listening and trying to fit it in. It seemed like, and and we had never played together before. I played a gig with Jeff Watts about three, four years ago. And him and I were like connected immediately, Mm. immediately. Like it, it felt like we had been playing together for years there was no fight at all. It was just boom. So I think it's different depending on who you work with and how, how you match up with them. It's, it's a very personal personality oriented. I found like you can't separate those two. I heard Ron Carter say this recently in an interview, the great bassist Ron Carter, he was saying, someone asked him about getting along with musicians and how that affects the music. And he said, it always affects the music. <laughs> mm. How you, how you interact with someone personally is always going to affect the music. How we hang is always going to affect the music, how we feel about each other, how we interact. It always has an imprint on the music, which I thought was fascinating really fascinating because we're trying to make a connection with somebody on the bandstand. And if it's somebody you really dig and 
and, and love and admire, then your connection is going to be so much stronger, you know, with, with your friends. My best friends are all drummers. I love them dearly. Um, and I love playing with them just like I love playing with you because we get along so well on the band's end. It's just a beautiful kind of, uh, blooming of that, you know? So I thought that was, I thought that's an interesting point. That's wild. So who would be the next one, uh, after PC that you've, that you feel kind of took the instrument maybe somewhere new or, or somewhere on, you know, slightly different. There's someone who kind of broke from the quarter note or what would be the next yeah, phase? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, my, my personal favorite after PC would be Ron Carter. I think his, his contribution to bass playing and walking is so, it can be so overlooked because he's so good at playing quarter notes and people take that for granted. But Ron Carter took the beat and he widened it. He made it super wide and fat and, um, he made the walking, he elevated the, the art of walking the bass um, and really bringing out what, what the group is doing, what the rhythm section is doing. Um, but as far as really technically and the bass kind of morphing into something else, it would probably be a Scott LaFaro. He's a mm. big influence of everybody. He was the first guy to really not walk. He came up with this thing with motion, with Paul Motion, in the Bill Evans trio where he started kind of dancing around the time where he wasn't, it was almost like a dialogue with Bill Evans. And you can really hear that on portrait and jazz, that record, how they kind of play off of each other and the live at the village Vanguard record where it, it's more than just the locking into a quarter note groove. And allegedly I heard somebody say that on the down low, he didn't like playing with Paul motion, <laughs> but he didn't like, he didn't like playing time with Paul motion. Okay. He didn't think Paul Motion swung that hard, so he just started trying to do something else that would work. Interesting. I, I can neither confirm nor deny that. <laughs> it's but funny he you bring definitely... up. Go ahead, I'm I'll sorry. say it's funny you bring up that record because I've been that's one that I play along to a lot recently, especially like late at night because I can play quietly to it. Um, Autumn leaves when they get into the bass solo it falls apart, right? It's, it's not in time. <laughs> yeah. It's not on the form, right? <laughs> yeah, or is it no, just it me? Seems like, it seems like everybody's trying to say something and people are waiting for someone else to kind of jump in. And that was, but that was kind of the, the metamorphosis of wh how the beat changed with him. It became this kind of dancing thing. And, and in a broader sense, he broadened the technique of all bass players. Um, before him, guys tended to stay lower on the instrument and play simpler ideas. And he he really opened up the entire instrument, including way up in thumb position, and made it very nimble. And it was like all the bass players that came after him, you can obviously hear his influence in Eddie Gomez and Dave Holland and Gary Peacock. And there, there was a whole legion of guys who brought this kind of technical singing kind of thing to the instrument that totally came out of LaFaro. Even Stanley Clark, you can hear, is a, is a, is a child of that kind of a, an approach. So how do you feel about Ron Carter and Tony Williams as a duo? Oh my goodness. One of, one of my favorite, if not my favorite duo in jazz, there's something about the two of them that, that has tension to it. Like there's all this tension and release in what they do. Um, the way that they played time together swung so hard. And that's where I have to start. It has to, for me, it has to swing. And the swing that those two brought is just undeniable. Um, the, the propulsion that they gave the music, the, the extreme dynamics that they gave to the music, the very, very loud and the very, very soft and all the colors in between is just amazing. It's just the, the first record that I fell in jazz in love with jazz with was a record from 1977 called third plane which is Ron Carter, Tony Williams, and Herbie Hancock. Before that, I'd been listening to like fusion and stuff, and I really didn't dig straight ahead jazz. And then my teacher laid that record on me, and I couldn't stop listening to it. The way Tony and Ron um, pushed and pulled and uh, made the music high and low um, and fat. Ron has this thing where he can make a note so fat like he's pulling on Tony <laughs> you know, 
and then Tony's pushing him and then the music lurches forward. And it, there was all this playfulness about what they did, this experimentation. And yet it still swung so hard. It never ceases to groove. One of my favorite records is, uh, is um, I believe it's, is it uh, ESP? Mm. The way that they get into these moments where there's this tension and then the highest level of swing you've ever heard in your life. It's, it's amazing to me. And Ron brings the sound, the tone, um, the very clear pulse and beat. It's just, it's like the best of both worlds to me. So I've always loved it. I've always been a fan when I was younger. That's what got me. That's what pulled me into straight ahead jazz was hearing the two of them play together. It was like, wow, this is special. They have a, really really super amazing thing and i got to play with tony williams believe it or not oh wow i was gonna ask <laughs> when, when i was 17 years old i played with tony williams he when i went to college our college i went to duquesne university i was a freshman in college and so colleges do this thing where they'll bring in guest soloists that's become a very popular kind of thing with university programs and our college was 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 getting into that, and our director brought in Tony Williams for the fir- my first college big band concert was Tony Williams was the guest soloist, and he had never done it before, which was the funniest thing. He kept telling us, "I've never done this. This is my first time doing this." And he had a huge drum set, and he literally played louder than our college band. <laughs> he drowned out the whole band. He played so loud. But it was still amazing. I don't remember a lot about it. I remember we played a bunch of his songs, his original compositions, because he's he was a great composer. Uh, he wrote great tunes, and I remember I got to play. For some reason, there were two bass there were two bass players, and for some reason, I was the guy that played all the the time tunes with him, all the quarter note straight ahead okay. things. And there is nothing more intimidating then launching into four, four time and looking over at Tony Williams, staring you dead in the face. (laughs) (laughs) Like, let's go. Like looking at me, you know, I'm 17 years old, 17 years old. And Tony Williams, you know, so that was one of the great thrills of my life. I I couldn't tell you if I I was probably dragging, you know, but uh, it was just just to be like riding, you know, riding the stallion. I got to get up there and be on the stallion (laughs) for 10 seconds. Man, that is crazy. I'm sure that was a follow along situation. (laughs) Oh, entirely. (laughs) Uh, I want to go back to a couple of the rhythm sections. I have another question. So. When you get into those sort of situations, when it gets a little bit looser and a little bit more open, like how do you how do you come back to the one? You know, like when you start to break free a bit, and it's like, oh, we're not playing that song four four anymore, or oh, this <laughs> isn't sticking to thirty two bars for the moment. Like, is it a look? Like, which one of you is like, hey, here's the one now? Like, how do you get back into it? <laughs> yeah, some somebody. Somebody has to take the initiative, I think. And we learn how to follow. Mm. We learn how to, you know, oh, okay, there it is. And sometimes, and some of my my drum colleagues will tell you, sometimes I'll go, okay, here's the one. And they'll look at me like, what are you doing? (laughs) (laughs) So You're not always going to be right. But I tell my students this, jazz, a lot of it is calculated guessing. We're Mm. guessing, we're, we're saying, okay, I think this here's the three things that could happen. I'm going to pick number two. And sometimes we all pick number two together and it's wonderful, but sometimes you pick number one and everybody else is on two or, you know, it's very, very educated guessing. And, um, you gotta, somebody usually does it and we follow, you know, Mm. endings are like that. When we end tunes, we don't know how tunes are going to end, but somebody at some point is going to go data and everybody else is going to follow. Right. You know, so it's about the the biggest skill you can have is listening. It's totally about listening, listening really, really hard. I've always felt that if you listen hard enough, as far as grooving, improvising, soloing, if you if you're listening super, super, super hard, it'll tell you what to do. It'll tell you what to do and when to do it. You just have to listen harder than anything else. Listen to everybody in the music harder than you're listening to yourself, for sure. Good advice. 
Do you prefer um, the drummer to count off the tunes? Yes, I do. I do. Um, I'll, I'm cool with the horn player counting off the tune. I never want to count the tune off myself. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I'm more of a follower. Uh, I like to follow and see where we're going uh, instead of the, the, the tune counter. But, yeah, I would prefer – but, I, I again, when somebody is flexible, it can move, you know. I, I think – when something is inflexible, that's when it kind of becomes not fun to me mm. is when you're playing with somebody who's like not paying attention or listening, uh, or who's like, okay, here it is. I'm not moving, I'm not moving. I'm not moving. Then it becomes a little stiff. You know, I think again, to bring up Ron and Tony, they were so organic and fluid. Um, my, my, one of my favorite records is that four and more live record with miles mm. and man, they take off on every song <laughs> where they start and where they finish is like, but that's the energy of the record. It's, it's amazing. Everything rushes, but there's so much energy and emotion. And I feel like if it wants to do that, let it do that. Let it breathe. You know, as long as we know what's happening, let's let it do what it's, whatever it's going to do. So yeah, as far as counting things off, I'd probably prefer that the drummer do it, but I'm cool with the horn player doing it. But with horn players, you know, you get what you asked for. <laughs> mm. And sometimes they don't always know how fast or how slow they're counting something off. I've also worked with singers who will count off something and eight bars into it, turn around and start clapping or oh, moving their hands because that, that, it's not the tempo that they meant it to be. So leave it, let the drummer do it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you, um, after a gig, do you think back, like, what could have been better? I mean, does that fuel your practicing, or is it whatever happens, happens, and move on to the next thing? Oh, my God. I totally have changed in this regard. I used to be very – part, part of getting better for me was learning how to be in that space where anything, where you let come out once, what wants to come out without mm -hmm. thinking – trying to get un uninterrupted flow and there it is. And I'm not going to think about it anymore and get depressed. Then recently, um, well, not recently. I've been, I, I, I would usually do a journal in my phone if I had a bad gig. Hmm. I wanted to know exactly why did I think it was bad? What was I feeling? Was it a sound issue? Was it a technical issue? Um, write down your feelings because I wanted it to be better. And then that morphed into just taking notes on every gig. I heard in an interview recently, Pat Metheny said he, he does about three or four pages worth of notes after every gig. I don't do that much, but I'm definitely writing down. I try to keep some kind of record or journal of what worked and what didn't work. And it could have been the audience was talking too much tonight. Um, I was rushing, getting into my ideas. I wasn't listening as hard as I should. I could really hear the bass well tonight because of this. So I try to make notes about what makes it good for me and what makes it bad for me so that I'll know going into a gig, I have a, I have a puncher's chance of it sounding good. Mm. So I, I found the evaluation process. If you want to get better, you have to, you have to self evaluate. And I, and I feel, I, and I doubt I'm, I, I doubt I'm ever going to feel like I'm in a place where, oh, okay, I'm as good as I want to be. And as long as I have progress to make, I got to keep track of where I'm at and what can I do to make it better? What can I do to improve upon what I did? What worked? Okay, let me do that again. So, you know, I, it, it might be unusual, but I, I like to really keep track. It's like going to the gym. Sometimes people in the gym, you see uh, people with little notebooks, you know, just writing down, okay, I did four sets of curls at 40 pounds and you keep track of your progress and I'm going to try heavier weight now. It's very similar to that. I found I'm, I'm, I'm really, I know how I want to sound and I'm always going to be chasing that, but I want to keep improving always. That is great. So is just the act of journaling enough or do you have to refer back to it to remind yourself or is it just putting it down, put makes it permanent for you? Um, I think the act of it is really important. It's almost like, like, like personal journaling. When you have like, you're, you're depressed, you have thoughts you want to get out and the act of writing it down is, is one huge thing that gets it out of you. 
Mm-hmm. But often I will refer to similar things over and over again. Like, for instance, one of my issues is that I play too hard. There's something with my sound that I'm not hearing and I'm pulling the string too hard. Mm. And I need to I need to play lighter. And I aspire toward that. And I like to keep writing that. If I do that on a gig, I'm going to write that down. You are playing too hard. And when I go back over things, I can see, wow, I'm playing too hard. This is coming up again and again. I need to work on this. Um, but also you can refer to it. You, you can see, am I making progress? Uh, here's the last week's worth of gigs. What things are coming up over and over again? Um, what are the good things? Wh- what made it good? Was it a sound issue? Was it an equipment issue? Uh, were my strings thuddy again? Um, it's just, it's almost like this outside observer. Mm-hmm. When you when you write down what's going on, you get this this fair assessment, I feel, of what's been going on. And you can see if there are any patterns that are developing. But I definitely some of it is just to get it out. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but I've had gigs where I was just like, this is hell <laughs> <laughs> because of because of this person, you know, this person who is rushing or dragging or playing out of tune is mm. making it terrible for me. Some, sometimes that's just to get it out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but some, sometimes it's really like, okay, let me go over my notes and see what we can do. It's like watching game film, you know, mm. man, that's great advice. I'll come back to some, some pointers in a bit. Let's talk about sure. the John Coltrane rhythm sections. Do you have a, a drummer bassist, pairing that you prefer in his bands oh my goodness i mean you gotta say reggie workman and elvin jones <laughs> yeah that's the the og the the you know the definitive arguably his artistic peak um arguably you know some people love him uh later on in his life but i'm a huge fan of of reggie workman and i'm sorry um uh i said reggie workman of uh of uh um, Garrison, Jimmy Garrison. Oh, okay. I was <laughs> going to ask you about Jimmy. <laughs> I'm sorry. I said I said Reggie Workman. Oh my goodness, I'm losing my mind. Jimmy Garrison and Elvin Jones. Excuse me. The <laughs> definitive section is the two of them. Um, there was something uh, uncontained about those guys. You know, something that was just bursting from the constraints of straight quarter notes and time as we knew it. Just like a Coltrane was kind of when you study his phrasing it's not up and down it's it can't be put in a box it can't be quantized you know what i mean it's mm-hmm. it's it's bursting it's groups of notes groups flurries emotions he found the perfect guys including mccoy because th- that group was just bursting from something and the thing about red uh i see i was gonna say reggie and this thing about jimmy garrison i got reggie workman on my brain the thing about <laughs> jimmy garrison is that he he could play great time there are times when he can play quarter notes where the music dictated that and then there are times that he would float and and fly and bring the music to another direction um and and he could set up a tune as well as anybody else he could play by himself as well as anybody else and the interludes that he provided in that band uh in addition to how he underpinned everything was was just brilliant and him and alvin together man it's ridiculous it's just ridiculous how the two of them played together um his beat was like a like a warehouse you know and alvin filled up that warehouse he like jimmy garrison gave all this space and alvin occupied that space if if that Mm. makes any sense um just amazing the two of them and all these rhythm sections they're all different personalities fitting together with each other in different ways, which is incredible. But yeah, I love my favorite train rhythm section is definitely Jimmy Garrison and Alvin Jones. <laughs> <laughs> so I think of that band is like one of the first examples of non-linear time playing. Like it's just, it's yeah. an experience. They're, they're playing quarter notes, but it's not going necessarily forward. It's just an experience. Um, yeah. You can hear that in Elvin's playing because he plays a lot of three-note groupings and things that just kind of force you out of any kind of linear box. From a bass mm-hmm. perspective, at that point, what do you do? I mean, if you're playing modally, like, how do you keep things kind of structured? 
where do you go with it? Oh, totally. Well, the difference between what Jimmy Garrison did and say Scott LaFaro, Scott LaFaro's approach, which wasn't based in quarter note time on those records, he's it was very much more soloistic and conversational. And I'm going to play something melodic in response to what you just played. And we're mm. both doing melodic things together. Um, Jimmy Garrison's thing was bass oriented, which I loved. He was going to be down in the in the real range of the instrument. He was going to be dealing with roots. If you listen to him, he's always playing rhythm. Always great rhythm with what he's playing. He might he might play sustained notes notes that ring out. Um, but he's always underpinning this groove. And I love how he kind of became the anchor. And a lot of bass players don't like that word as far as bass players go. Ron Carter has said he, he doesn't like being referred to as the anchor because that implies that you're holding the ship back, <laughs> keeping the, the ship from going somewhere. But truly, Jimmy Garrison gave this kind of anchor for all these guys to dance over top of. But he always played groove in my opinion there was always strong time there was always solid rhythm there even if it was in bits with big sustained notes he was always providing groove and him and alvin again they had that that mind link when you hear them playing um super mind link where they're finishing each other's sentences but if you listen jimmy garrison it was totally about groove totally about groove everything he did strong groove time that just brought everything back home. And I love how they would get, when you listen to those long, long tracks and long improvisations, how they kind of go far away and then it comes back. And when it comes back, there's Jimmy Garrison. You know, he's like the guy standing there kind of, kind of bringing the plane in, so to mm -hmm. speak, you know, it's amazing. There's one basis that I still don't understand. I can't quite, crack is charles mingus oh. what is your thoughts on mingus because i there's not a i cannot it's like his music to me is a, it's it's separate from the rest of the lexicon of jazz in my mind i can't <laughs> listen to it the same way well we can't I, I think we can't think of him in in a traditional way as far as okay here are the great rhythm sections you know and charles mingus and Danny mm -hmm. Richmond, you know, it's very different because Mingus was coming from a place where it was his music and his sound, and he dictated the direction of that music. And he was such a powerful personality on and off the bandstand that he was calling the shots as far as the direction that his music went in. So everybody, you know, it's almost like on some of his records, everybody is following him. Mm -hmm. Everybody is following Mingus. And he's really, he's really dictating the tempo and the, and the emotion and everything is coming from Mingus, which is just amazing. It's very similar, I would say, to Monk, where you don't think of Monk as like, oh, yeah, he's this incredible sideman who's on all these records and listen to the way that he's comping. No, Monk's music was about Monk. Listen mm -hmm. to Monk. He's the, he's the leader of the show and everybody's following Monk. Um, I see Mingus in very much the same way. He's a singular voice, no doubt. One of the most incredible sounds on the bass, recognizable um, sounds, no doubt about that. One of the great composers in jazz comes directly from the Duke Ellington lineage as, as a jazz composer. Um, but as far as playing with the rhythm section, I don't tend to think of him as one of the great rhythm section players, although he did a lot of wonderful rhythm section playing. Um, it, it was about his music more than kind of playing with a lot of different people, playing standards with a lot of different people, the way we think about it. I'll tell you a funny story about Mingus. I bought the, the record Money Jungle when I was 19 years old. I went to National Record Mart and I bought it on CD because I picked it up and it was Duke Ellington, and Max Roach and Charles Mingus. And I was like, oh my God, this must be the greatest record ever. <laughs> and I put it on at home and I couldn't get through 10 minutes of it. Same. I was like, what <laughs> is this? What is this noise? <laughs> I did not get it at all until I got, until I was much older. 
much, much older. Then you can kind of hear the three personalities. It's really these three incredible personalities kind of making music together. But it's an example of it's not so so much straight straight up lineage. He's he's somebody, man, he had his own thing. He had his own thing and people were following him because he was one of the greatest, one of the greatest voices in the music, uh, no doubt. Do you introduce him to your students or is that something that you let them kind of discover on their own? Um, either or, uh, he's not, the, the thing is that a lot of my students need to work on playing time, um, having fundamentals. I need to, have, my first concern is trying to make them better, uh, in a situation where they have to step in and play with someone or play a gig or sit in or play with a drummer they've never met. And in order to have the tools to do that, I like to start from much more basic approaches paul chambers ray brown like let, let's work on the basics of playing quarter notes and walking and mingus is kind of a step above that mm. whether it's the kind of changes he played with the techniques he used um even the way he played time was so forceful <laughs> and so mm -hmm. like follow me um that it's hard to begin with him he's someone that we can get to later um, but I like to start with the fundamentals first. The thing about Mingus is he was such a unique cat uh, that I don't have to tell a lot of my students about him. He's, he's often the bass player that a lot of people notice first, mm -hmm. right away. People, m many more people who aren't musicians, uh, I found, identify with Mingus and know who Mingus is before they know who Paul Chambers is, you know, because he was that much of a, of a force, a musical force. Um, than those guys, but we, we get to Mingus. Mingus is definitely important, but as far as playing the basics of jazz bass, he's someone we, we get to eventually. Who do you like on bass with Art Blakey? Ooh, that's a good question. Can I say all of them? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Has he ever made a bad record? I mean, seriously. <laughs> My goodness. All of them. Well, talking about Reggie Workman, <laughs> ah, the, the right name there. Um, Reggie Workman, um, Charles Fambro, Peter Washington, um, Doug Watkins. There's so many. Probably, if there was one name that I had to pull out, it would probably be Doug Watkins. Doug, Doug Watkins was so super important to bass playing, um, not only because his time was great, but his touch was so light. And his sound was so big and easy. It was effortless when he played. And the way he played with Blakey was effortless. I think one of his main contributions is this, is this um, totally effortless, um, swinging, huge groove. And he's, he's overlooked by a lot of people. But Doug Watkins, I definitely think of him. He's, he's in that top three when I think about Art Blakey. But I mean, like... I uh, named a bunch of names for you. There's so many, you know, bass players. Uh, name the bad record, you know, Mickey Bass, um, Dennis Irwin. Like, <laughs> who made a bad record with Art Blakey? It's hard to, to think of who. Everybody, he, he made everybody better. There's so many. But Doug Watkins is definitely, you know, the standard, the standard bearer for that band. Mm. Okay, let's talk about electric bass. If you had to pinpoint your your starting point for electric bass who would it be Ooh, that's a good question um probably james jamerson mm -hmm. um he th the sound his approach and the ironic thing is that jamerson was an upright guy who was kind of approaching the electric bass like an upright bass but what he brought as far as his touch and the subdivision and what he played in the jazz kind of mentality to what he played on the electric bass, but he's the, he's the father of it. He's the, completely the father of the instrument, the way that everybody approaches the instrument today from Paul McCartney to Jocko to Marcus Miller to Victor Wooten. We all owe something to James Jamerson. He's, he's ground zero. So yeah. Um, well, I was trying to learn bass a while ago and I started with Bob Marley records. Ooh. I feel like we don't talk enough about that rhythm section. No, definitely not. Definitely not. That was, um, um, was that Aston family man? Yeah. And Carly Barrett. Yep. 
Yeah, so so great as far as sound and what they that music in general is just genius, isn't it? Mm. It's it's very similar I found to Brazilian music. So Brazilian music had this kind of samba thing that happened for centuries and at some point they said let's slow it down and make it more nuanced and it became bossa nova. And the same thing happened with reggae where there was this energy ska, high energy ska and then at some point they said, let's slow it down and explore the groove more. And it became this way more nuanced, incredible genius sound. Uh, but yeah, no, I love, I love reggae. I love family man. I love Sly and Robbie. Um, it's all about tone and repetition, sim- simplicity, mm-hmm. and finding the pocket, you know, repetition would legitimize as they say, um, love that music. That's an undeniable, undeniable influence. So this is something I talk to with students a lot because they always want to know about laying back or head of the beat, behind the beat, all that kind of stuff. And I often have to tell them, you can, if you can't play in time, don't even consider what any of that stuff means first. You got to play in time first. But correct me if I'm wrong, but I think a lot of it is actually what the drums and bass are doing together rather than the drums being deciding to be behind or whatever. It's like... And then how do you develop that trust of, well, I'm going to sit behind, so don't slow down, dude. Like, is that a spoken thing or an unspoken thing? <laughs> I think it's a, I think it's an unspoken thing. Uh, I think it's a nonverbal thing for sure. We have ways of communicating on the bandstand, but it, it boils down to being a trust issue. I think with my favorite drummers, um, if we need to nudge something or they want to nudge something, we can do it by just looking at each other Mm -hmm. or say I'm playing with the drummer and I feel something kind of pulling to the back of the beat. And I look at whoever whoever I'm playing with and they'll give me a look like, yeah, we need to do this now. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Then we agree. It's about agreeing on whatever you're going to do, agreeing and going there, having control over it rather than letting it control you and, and get out of hand. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, I definitely think, it's, it's totally a trust issue, which is why it's so special when you meet somebody and you have that connection immediately. That's why, I, and I, to this day, I keep talking about how when I played with Tane, how easy it was. Mm-hmm. Like, everything I played felt great. Everything. It was like we did everything together. And it was so effortless. And it's a trust game. It's totally a trust game. Um, which means, oh, you want to go, you want to lean on the edge of it. Let's go there. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Let's, oh, we, there, there are even times where I play with guys and we might start pulling things back and slowing way down just mm-hmm. to be crazy. But it's, it's the trust that to do that. Oh, this is okay. And not, what are you doing? Or not even listening. You know, mm-hmm. it's the, the great rhythm sections, man. They know how to do it. They move, move together. However, they're going to move. And it's organic and amazing and not just metronomic. Mm-hmm. And you're not, I'm at 181 and you're at 180 and it's not working. You know, it's not always going to be that. Do you have a bass drum relationship that you think swings hardest where the bass is the leading edge or the ride symbol is the leading edge? Like where, it, where you two sit vertically? Do you mean personally or like on a record? Personally when you're playing. Oh my goodness. Well, you know what I said about personal relationships? I have a different relationship with all the drummers I play with. Mm. And I feel like they all do something really great. That's a little different. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, some drummers like uh, you had Tom Wen on the show, who's Mm -hmm. one of my top three favorite cats, hands down. We do a lot of straight ahead gigs together. He's going to give it to me. He's going to really give it to me the best time, the clearest way. It's like giving me a huge hoop to throw the ball through. Mm -hmm. And all I have to do is put the ball up. And it's different than somebody whose time is going to move a little bit and be more fluid and push and pull. Um, But it's different for different drummers. There are different things. I don't think – I think for each drummer that I love playing with, I could name you one or two of my favorite things that they do uh, as opposed to different drummers. So Tom's thing is I love how he swings. I love how his beat feels when we get in the shuffles. 
uh, and ballads, unbelievable. Someone like Dave Throckmorton, who's one of my best friends, play with him all the all the time. I love how hard he listens and how mm. we can take a left at any time. And he's totally open to it. He's totally creative and open, and he's going to go. You know, it, whatever decision somebody makes, he's musically right there. Mm-hmm. And and he's also like the greatest drummer on the planet <laughs> as far as his chops and everything. But that makes it fun for me as a bass player. Um, everybody has something different. James Johnson, who's a fabulous drummer that I played with in town um, since I since he was twelve and I was sixteen. We played we played together Saturday night. He has arguably the most musical way of playing the drums that I've ever had with somebody musically and the sounds he creates. Um, he can make his cymbals sound like things that aren't cymbals mm. <laughs> and mm. his drums when he plays. I'm not hearing drums when he plays. I'm hearing musical things happen in the way he responds. So everybody has something different that they bring to the table. So I couldn't really name, I couldn't tell you name one guy without excluding the other six. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Um, everybody has something magical that I love playing with. Um, do you have a favorite James Brown rhythm section? Oh, that's a tough one. Well, as a bass player, um, I think I would... St- I think I would get beat up if I didn't say Bootsy. <laughs> I love Bootsy. I love Bootsy. And, uh, Jabbo? Did Bootsy and Jabbo, do they play on the band together? Yeah, I think it was the end of Jabbo's turn and then Clyde. Jabbo and Clyde, yeah. Okay. I mean, Jabbo and Clyde, obviously. Fred Thomas, Bootsy, those four cats. You can put whoever you want with whoever. Fred Thomas and Bootsy on bass, Jabbo and Clyde on drums. Um, that that stuff, I, I love JB. That stuff to me is like great jazz records. It sounds like they were playing for an hour, and they started running the tape. You know, the last, you know, at fifty-five minutes, mm-hmm. <laughs> and you're hearing the last five minutes of an hour-long jam. Is there a contemporary rhythm section that you find particularly inspiring and maybe doing something different? Wow, that's a good question. Um, Because of my age, when you say contemporary, I'm probably going to name something from the 90s. (laughs) (laughs) But I love, um, to be honest with you, Marcus Miller and Steve Jordan is one of Mm. the first ones that comes to mind. The way the two of them play together is ridiculous. Um, the, the pocket, the groove, um, who else? Jocko and Peter Erskine. Mm-hmm. That's, that's one of the classic rhythm sections in my opinion. Um, Christian McBride and Brian blade. Mm-hmm. They've always played well together. Um, those two guys are amazing. The connection that they have, um, who else can that name for you? Um, Anthony Jackson and Steve Jordan. The records that they did to get all the, although I could say Anthony Jackson with almost anybody, he's incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, I grew up a huge, huge, huge fan of the Chicory Electric Band. So I would be remiss if I didn't say Patitucci and Weckle. Mm-hmm. There's got to be some of that DNA that rubbed off on me. And um, this is going to shock you. Um, I started listening to rock. The reason I play bass is because of the rock. So I have to, I have to say Getty Lee and Neil Peart. Wow. Those two guys. I did not peg you for a Rush fan. <laughs> oh my God. Getty Lee and Neil Peart, the way those two guys totally locked up, the, the, the way they played together, the brilliance with which, man, you can't, you can't top that. What is your so top, what's your top Rush record? Like what was the one that you listened to the most? Uh, well, okay. That's a hard question. Cause I have, the one that's kind of my favorite or the one that resonated with me when I was young. And then there's the, like the best one, the obviously the best one. So that's like asking me who, who's the best James Bond. And I would tell you, okay, Sean Connery hands down was the best, but my dude was Roger Moore. Yes. I grew up <laughs> with the Roger Moore movies. Like he was hilarious. He was totally chill all the time. He had the best <laughs> gadgets. So, <laughs> as far as Rush goes, um, the best record is, is Moving Pictures. It's the best one. It's the best one. That's the, them at their peak. 
not a bad song. The sounds are great. Every everything is a banger. YYZ is on there. It's incredible. The record I connected with when I was a, a teenager was Grace Under Pressure. Okay. Ironically, which is not not one of their better records, but there was something about those sounds um and and the songs and like i just really connected with grace under pressure so i listened to probably those two records the most um moving pictures never ceases to inspire me but when i listen to grace under pressure i i, I become a teenager again <laughs> amazing for me it was presto that was the record that i got oh into well you're young you're younger than me i remember when presto came out when i was in high school that's when i i kind of said okay i'm gonna do this jazz thing i kind of <laughs> left them presto i didn't i didn't get in anything after presto do you think drummers should learn a little bit of bass oh my goodness yes yes i think all musicians should learn all instruments i think if you're a bass player you i make all my college kids sit down and play drums for a lesson Mm. and keep time uh and you need to learn piano uh i think if you're a drummer you should learn some bass you should learn some piano Dave Throckmorton and I, when we were on the road with Maynard Ferguson, we gave each other lessons on the road. We made mm. this deal. So he gave me some drum lessons and I gave him some bass lessons. And out of that came the fact that I can play funky drummer for about four bars. <laughs> I can, he showed me, he showed me how to play funky drummer and he showed me how to really get that snap on the snare drum on the rim and make it go like, what? <laughs> so yeah, I think it only makes you a better musician. There's a reason that the greatest athletes in the world, they're, they play basketball, they play baseball, they play football, volleyball, whatever. It only makes you more well-rounded as a musician to be exposed to those things. Sweet. I only have a couple more questions for you. So sure. um, this is for everyone who's, who's looking for work. What skills or traits do you find a drummer has to have before you will recommend him or her for a gig? Ooh. Well, it goes without saying you got to have good time. You have to have good time. That's, but that's a non-negotiable. Mm-hmm. Um, hopefully if you're on the bandstand, if we're on the bandstand together, you're there because you can keep time. You don't really rush. You don't drag. Um, but the second thing is you got to listen hard. You have to be listening to what everybody else is doing. You have to listen and respond to what the soloist is doing, to what the piano player is doing. Um, musically be there and listen Um, and I I tell people this about Jeff Watts he was not only the loudest drummer I've ever played with he was louder than Tony Williams he was the loudest drummer I've ever played with he was also the softest drummer I've ever played with Hmm. he had this ability to totally be absolutely too loud and then be unbelievably quiet and I've never played with a drummer who had that kind of range, but he was listening like crazy. So musically, those things are there. You got to listen. You got to really listen uh, and have your time together, uh, and, and that it feels good. But the, the other stuff go, you know, is show up on time. You know, be prepared for the gig. If there was music you had to look at or have prepared, come ready to play that music. Um, you know, be uh dress for the gig if you have to dress for the gig properly and be a good person and and good on the hang get along with everybody um be be a nice cat that that goes a long 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 way there are a lot of guys out there who are great cats and and playing okay and some guys who play wonderfully but on the hang side people just can't get with them and they're sitting at home Mm -hmm. getting along with people and being able to communicate with people will get you a far, far, far away. But so there are basics you have to have together, but you got to be a good person too. that. That's, that's the final piece of the puzzle. Do you care about the gear that a drummer brings? Do you care if it's bright symbols, dark symbols, high tune? No. And I, I've played with a lot of different drummers and I never ceases to amaze me when drummers always, this is all my boys. Hey man, look at this ride symbol I just got. Listen to this. Ding, <laughs> ding. And I'm like, yeah, man. Symbol to me. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily have a preference. 
Um, because I know, to, to quote my friend Throck, when I change strings, hey, check out these strings I'm trying out. His response is always the same. Well, you still sound like PT. Mm-hmm. You still sound like you. And when I hear a drummer, you know, playing on an incredible new cymbal or whatever, you still sound like you. You know, and I've played with drummers with like riveted sizzle cymbals that, that ring for days. And I grew up playing with a great drummer in town named Greg Humphreys. His ride cymbal literally sounded like this. Kink, 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 kink. And I loved it. I loved playing with them. So, I mean, I, I don't have a huge opinion on on cymbals as long as the guy playing the cymbals, the, the guy or woman playing the cymbals is cool, then I'm cool. Okay. <laughs> that is good to hear, everyone listening. <laughs> <laughs> You can keep your junky gear, just be a cool hang. <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, there's a great Roger Humphreys quote. He said, um, it ain't the horse, it's the jockey, baby. <laughs> right. It ain't the horse, it's the jockey. So that's always been my thing. Well, I appreciate you sitting and chatting bass and drums with me. Um, what's next? What do you got coming up? More YouTube stuff? Oh, definitely. I'm... Uh... I've entered kind of a new stage with my YouTube since the beginning of the year. I kind of cracked the algorithm a little bit. And so I'm getting way, way, way more views on my videos. I'm trying a a new format where I'm making them shorter and I'm doing very clickbaity titles, (laughs) which is giving me all these views, which is really awesome and weird. So I'm going to keep doing my channel, but the gigs have all come back like Avengers Endgame. Somebody snapped their fingers Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, everybody's schedules f- filled up. So it's it's getting back into that and and continuing to work, find the time to practice and work on my playing because I'm still trying to get better. I still want to get better at this. All right, hope you enjoyed that chat with Paul. Again, please go over to his YouTube channel. Just search Paul Thompson Bass. You'll find it. He's got some great videos. Again, most of it is geared towards the bassist, but there is a lot of stuff there that helps us as drummers and the better rhythm section mates. So check that out. And now let's get into our shop talk section. This week, Chris Hawthorne and I are trying to unravel this mystery kit that came through his his shop that has no badges, no markings. So let's check it out. And how do you identify a strange vintage mystery kit? All right. So today's topic what do you do when you have a bizarre unidentifiable drum kit how do we kind of figure out what the heck this is so this kit has no badges no markings whatsoever it's got things that look sort of like slingling but not it's bizarro so chris first of all tell us where you got this kit and then let's go through and figure out what the heck it is so um i got this last month from a guy in maryland i think he probably got on a Craigslist or something. Um, and he called it the mystery kit because like you said, there's like there's no identification anywhere on this kit. There's no stamps. Like you said, there's no badges and there was like the grommet here, you probably can't see it, but there's not even a place for like a badge to fall off. So there was yeah. never any badges in the first place. It's a well kept mystery kit. <laughs> yeah. Um so kind of like you said, the history, I got it last month. He didn't really know anything about it. Mm-hmm. Um, there's not like any weird like telltale signs that there was a badge or anything else. Like this looks like just the way that it was made. Um, it's got like a foil wrap. <laughs> this is crazy. Which I've never seen before. Uh, you know, I've seen wallpaper put yeah. on drums. I've seen uh, leather. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen a foil, and he, you know, he, whoever did this did a pretty nice job. If you take the heads off, you can kind of see where he marked where the wrap's going to go with the pencil. Um, so, do you think this is a homemade kit, or was it built in a factory? I think that it, that if I had to guess, you know, with all my history of listening to true crime, <laughs> uh, somebody probably bought shells from a factory and drilled it out and probably made some of these parts on his own. The most intriguing part about this kit to me, Mike, is is this, and I don't think you can see it, but this is a cymbal mount. But when we were putting together the kit, it's like not like a like a classic L-arm cymbal mount. It's like literally he made it so you could just use a cymbal stand. Stick your cymbal stand in it. Which is what we did. We took part of the DW and just 
kind of jammed it in there. And it's got this little, it's, you know, frankly, it's whoever made it did a pretty dang good job. So let's go through a bit by bit. The tension rods are weird. We determined they're steel, but they don't look like any tension rods I've seen. The lugs sort of look like what they might be Slingerland lugs. I think the lugs are actually Slingerland. And I think because it, it, it almost looks like they're aluminum, but they're not. It looks like he somebody brushed them. Yeah. I don't know why somebody would do that, but they definitely look like they're Slingerland. The they could be they could be Japanese, but okay. And the hoops look like fake Slingerlands. Yep, they're, they're probably Japanese. And you can see the weld seam on the hoops. Like there's two weld seams in this hoop here, um, which usually means it's some sort of import hoop. Oh, you can see, really? Yeah, and you can see. I mean, the 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 plating is flaking off. You can see like the metal underneath there. Okay. So, so if you can see weld seams in the hoops, that means they're imports. If it's like a very visible. Well, see, usually it's like if it's a, an American company, they did like a, a better job of hiding like a weld. Mm. You know what I mean? Okay. So originally before we started recording, you thought this was European, but it sounds like it's about a lot of Japanese parts. Yes. So I think the shells would look European to me, which is weird because they're Luan. So a lot of stuff, you know, coming out of England was birch or beach. Mm -hmm. Premier was birch. They used some beach rings. Sonar. Uh, yeah, beach. Olympic. A lot of the stuff in Europe was birch, but these aren't birch shells. But they're also not like the thin Luan shells you'd get on a stencil kit. Mm -hmm. So stencil kits, if you know what a stencil kit is, it's a uh, kit that was made in one of the factories in Japan. Put a bunch of, there's like hundreds of different brands, not hundreds, but a lot of different brands with different badges, but they're essentially all the same shells. These are thicker shells. So they're thicker Luan shells. They look like they're six ply. And then they have thick rings. I've seen that one time on a kit, and I can't remember where it was made. But it just seems they, they look like they're a little better quality than what will come out of a Japanese factory. So where did they come from? I think some guy bought these from a drum factory. And there are lots of, not lots, but there are German brands and Italian brands of drums that are smaller that like you wouldn't probably have even heard of. And like mm. I'm not familiar with the history of that very well either. But they will pop up from time to time. So I think somebody bought the shells. He drilled everything out and he had to be some sort of engineer or metal worker because mm -hmm. again, it's like, uh, it's not a bad job on these at all. And there's a couple weird things which I'll point out later, but one thing that sticks out to me is the, I mean, this all looks like somebody just made this, mm -hmm. but again, like did a pretty decent job. This was designed, looks like after a Camco mount, it's kind of like a hexagon but it's bigger than a Camco and it only has two screws. Um, and the screws are just like regular old. Yeah. They're, they're, <laughs> so the tension rods you pointed out, like all the washers literally are just washers from a, a hardware store. Right. And all the bowls, all the thumb screws. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's almost like plumbing material here. So somebody made, which is why I think it's, it's probably European because I think somebody who, you know, maybe got a European shell, um, Oh, there, there's also another. I have a kit that has this type of hoops on it where it's, it's, so these actually, I don't know if you can see this. Th these aren't metal hoops. This is a wood, a Luan wood hoop that somebody put a metal kind of covering on. And it's the like thick piece of metal. It's not yeah, a foil. It's but like I have a, a kit in the back where it's, it's a wood veneer and it looks like it's an inlay. And I think that that's also a German kit. Mm. What's the name of it? I can't remember. But there's kind of like hints that make me think that that's why, it, you know, it, it's a European kit. Now, is all Luan vertical grain? Is that a telltale sign of Luan? Yeah. Some, now, some brands will put a veneer on it to make it look like the, like a real thin. Sometimes it's maple. Sometimes it's beach. To make on the it look, inside? Yeah. To make oh. it look like it's not a veneer or like a not a. You know? <laughs> tricky, tricky. <laughs> yeah. I have, I have a. Uh, do we look at that on the last one? It's the Norma kit. Yeah. It has a veneer on the inside. Yeah. Beautiful. So. Cool. Yeah. You can tell with the hoops, there's definitely a vertical grain. Mm -hmm. What else can we talk about? The snare drum is freaking strange. So, <laughs> so did, can you hear all the <laughs> stuff hear all inside? The dust inside? That throw off playing it? makes no sense whatsoever. So that looks like there was, uh, Kent had a, another brand, which the name is escaping me, and they had a throw off look like this. And I, I call it like a mouse ear throw off for whatever reason. 
which is what, again, what it looked like it was designed off of. This is the weird part. It literally has this screw Just in like here, a, regular a hardware screw. store screw that you tighten and loosen up the tension on the wires. But it works fine. It works like, fine. It works, but like that's not, somebody made that. Yeah, that's machined. That should be pouring beer out of that. Heck yeah. Or cranking down some straps or something. <laughs> but very cool. Very interesting. The only thing he didn't think about is like how the handle comes above the hoop. Yeah. So somebody, if we were to play this for a long time, they would definitely like break a knuckle on it. Yeah, that's a big chunky handle too. <laughs> what else is weird about it? I mean, oh, so, is... so there are a couple of things. So when we put set this up, and I haven't taken like a close look at this. Um, I thought this was a 16. This is a 15. 15 by 15, yeah, right? Yeah, we, we is... tried. So here are the hoops. This is another thing. So these are the hoops that were on here. Heads. Heads, that's the hoops. Yeah. <laughs> and you think these were homemade. They could be somebody just like took and tucked their own heads with like a, but they're not tucked. So again, I, I don't know what is up with this. But we tried to put new heads on there and a 16 didn't fit and we found it was a 15. So this is a 15 by 15. That's unusual. Which, yeah, which is unusual. Um, the floor t or the bass drum is a 20 by 15. Also which is unusual. also unusual. And then a shallow 13. 8 by 13. Sonar made 8 by 13s. Mm. So the size is also kind of make me think that it's you know, from Europe. Um, yeah, very strange. I mean, the, the, somebody made, this is not a, <laughs> this is not a real thing. Like, look at, look at this T handle here. And that washer again is from, <laughs> is from a hardware Straight store. Straight from a local and, hardware store. And maybe somebody like put their own, you know, washers on here, but. Do you have a, a guess on the year for something like this? Um, Probably 60s, maybe late 50s. Okay. Yeah, it feels like a... Like, look at that. There's... <laughs> you can kind of see, like, the machine marks on there, too. But I've, Well done, whoever did it. Yeah, I mean, listen, if you made this kit, we would love to speak with you. <laughs> because we have, we have very many, many questions. Many questions. So this kind of piggybacks on what we talked about in... The episode with you is why would you buy this? Because it's cool, because it it's on brand for you. I mean, how do you put a value to it? I mean, it's cool. I'll say it's cool. So that's, that's a couple of things when, I, when you think about taking stuff on is like, um, how does it sound? Is there a market for it? Um, if there's like, sometimes you get stuff that's like rare and like you can't go and find like, Sold listings for something, so you kind of have to get. It. Mm -hmm. I bought this because it's cool. Um, I love the wrap. It's and honestly, like for how kind of like old the hardware looks, the wrap looks like it's brand new. Yeah, it does. Which I think is pretty cool. Um, looks like a bowling alley or a roller skating rink or something. <laughs> right. So it's cool. And, and honestly, like oh, and the bags. Hold on, let me go grab a bag. <laughs> so so Here's the bags. So. This to me is the, Let me put the, this down. <laughs> the clear sign that these are homemade drums because they came in perfectly fabricated tablecloth bags that someone spent a lot of time, hours, <laughs> sewing these bags together. That might be for the That's Tom. Not the <laughs> I don't know, like you ever been to like your aunt's or whatever? <laughs> And they pull out like their <laughs> their, their tablecloth for the family union they've had since like 1975. Like, that's what this looks like, or like a, a a lawn chair bag. Is it possible that this wrap is a tablecloth? You know, Mike, anything is possible. <laughs> um, Whoever made those hold on. did an amazing job. Unbelievable. Yeah, I'm gonna say 100. percent This is a homemade kit. There's no way that you would take the time to make bags for it if you didn't also make the drums. <laughs> Imagine carrying this to a gig. And you know what? None of it's ripped. Yeah, it's got nice buckles on it or yeah, whatever you like call that. Pretty great. It's it's honestly like kind of <laughs> the kit's cool but the bags are like cooler. <laughs> you know, this is one of the few cases Mike where somebody says, "Hey, it comes with the original case." 
and I don't have to say that's great. I'm probably going to throw them away. Yeah, yeah, I know. These are actually original cases. Well, and like one of a kind. Yeah, like the, the all those fiber cases just kind of break, but <laughs> yeah. So the kit, you know, it's sold with the cases too. So you know, if you're a, a hard touring drummer or spending months and months on the road, these cases will 100% last you. <laughs> this is definitely your everyday gig and kit. What an anomaly. So, yeah, I think the moral of the story is don't be afraid of the weird stuff. Um, well, it's one of a kind kit. I mean, like, if you're if you're somebody who's looking for something that they can, you know, I wouldn't gig with something like this because of the spurs and all that stuff, but somebody like you have a recording set up or something like you want to keep at your house, it's cool and yep. quote-unquote vibey. It's not a, a ton of money. This is perfect. It's got a vibe. It's definitely got a vibe. I don't know that I could get this from a brand new off the shelf, whatever, pick your big name kit. <laughs> you couldn't get this vibe. And Mendini on Amazon makes a very similar kit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know those kits? The kids no. kits? Yeah, that's a, that's a whole other, that's a, that's another podcast. All right. So this is the mystery kit. The mystery kit. Yes. Did we solve it? I don't know. I'd say it's homemade. I'll put all my money on that. And you say it's European, so... I believe we call it European Homemade Kit. There we go. There you go. That is it for this week's episode. Please, if you don't mind, head over to iTunes, wherever you get your podcast, give us a five-star rating, drop a written review. That helps get this show into the ears of more drummers around the world. Until next week, go shed with Paul Thompson's bass parts on his YouTube channel. See ya.